singing country music. That's what I've always dreamt of doing as a young boy growing up in South Carolina. It was out of the ordinary to dream such a dream. I moved to Nashville to get a record deal. and I didn't really know what I was doing. My faith was really tested. I wrote this song called Long Black Train. When I laid the pen down, I said, nobody's ever going to want to hear this. In Fairfield County, something new comes across my desk every day. Crimes are committed, cases are solved, and a community is made safe by the hardworking employees of the Fairfield County Sheriff's Office. Welcome to This Week with Sheriff Dave Fail, and a weekly program here on LSN Television. We're also carried by a number of radio affiliates here in Fairfield County. Do appreciate you, the viewers and listeners that join us each and every week. We've got a great guest, and we're honored to have Judge Dave Tremor with us. Sheriff Phelan, thank you very much. Uh, an old friend. We've known each other, wow, when you were a prosecutor. Many years. about 15 years now. At least. Yes, yeah, sir. Yeah. Do appreciate your service and... Uh, and congratulations on your recent appointment to Common Pleas. Thank you very much. Can you believe my first day is today? Wow, that's exciting. Imagine what it feels like to leave the old place where you worked for 11 years and to show up at your new place. Wow, wow. Before we get into that, tell us a little bit about your background. All right, well, let's see. I, I have three degrees. Um, I went to Ohio University and I had a journalism degree there. I have a a uh, master's in communication from the University of Northern Colorado and a law degree from Capital University. Okay. And um, yeah, my first my first real job, I well, I shouldn't say it that way, but I, I I've worked a number of different jobs. I've worked in the insurance industry, also worked for AT and T, uh, which has become Lucent Technologies, and I was working in their public relations department there. Okay. And uh, that that was all while I was going to law school. And so it was a miserable time in my life because I was working in a factory, actually, working a lot of overtime, going to law school at night. And in three and a half years, I had accomplished uh, my degree. And uh, so my first official job uh, as a lawyer now was working as a prosecutor in Athens, Ohio. Okay. And I did that for about three years before becoming a prosecutor here in Fairfield County. And so I have a total of about 10 years of prosecution experience. And then after that, I became a municipal court judge. And I've been serving the people of Fairfield County as a municipal court judge for 11 years. Just got elected into my new position in Common Police Court. Was it a, um, a difficult transition to go from a prosecutor to a judge? It really was not. Okay. I was surprised. Yeah. Uh, but I spent so much time in a municipal courtroom right. that, that it, was a, it was a relatively easy transition to make. I have found that my path keeps following that of Judge Martin's. Okay, Judge Chris well, that's, Martin. a, that's a great, uh, it is a great person to be following, it's a that's great for sure. Path. And so uh, he was the municipal court judge, and then I became municipal court judge. He then became a common police court judge, and here I am taking over his position. Not that I can ever replace Judge Martin, uh, because he's such a well respected individual. Um, I'm going to do my best to fill his shoes. Well, you've done a terrific job in the municipal court. You just have a passion for what you do. I, I and, love and it. And it shows. It really does. I mean, sure. you care about these people. Sheriff, I thank you for that. I, yeah. I feel that way, truly. I, I believe that I was um, a person that was born to serve others. Right. So, so uh, a little bit, you, you, you have the drug court, you had the drug court? I did have the drug court. And I guess even before we go a little bit further, I probably a lot of viewers and listeners that are not familiar with the court system, what is the difference between the municipal court and the common police? Sure. Um, the jurisdiction of a municipal court judge is as follows. Uh, if, if it's a civil case, okay. up to $15,000 in damages. Okay. Also, all misdemeanors are prosecuted in municipal court. Okay. And also small, small claims uh, cases are handled in municipal court. Anything over and above all of that is handled in common police court. So you have a lot more serious felon, well, serious cases like felony cases, right. uh, major drug cases, murders, um, big time theft cases. 
And then the civil cases, of course, are anything over a claim of $15,000 in damages. Is there any particular case that's already been uh, uh, disposed of that really comes to mind and since you've been in municipal court that said, wow, this is a, uh, something that really kind of took me back a little bit? Well, that kind of puts me on the spot there, <laughs> Sheriff. Thanks for asking <laughs> maybe, that question. <laughs> maybe you can't share that. I don't know. Uh, uh, let me ask you, how many cases does a municipal court judge hear during the course of a year? Well, in uh, Fairfield County, we have 22,000 cases a year, which includes criminal and civil. Well, and that traffic. is amazing. That is amazing. It really is. And, of course, there's two municipal court judges, so okay. each one handles half of that burden. That still seems like it would be pretty overwhelming. It's it, You are busy. It's, uh, it's uh, wow. It's really the ground floor of society and dealing with society's issues and problems. Not that everyone who gets a traffic ticket is, you know, a big concern for the court. That's absolutely not true. But um, I can tell you that in that position in municipal court, you are in the front lines where you see all the present trends occurring in our communities and our society. In our society, and it's uh, it's kind of troubling, really, when you look and see where. Um, where society has been heading for the last 10 years or so. What's the, what's the biggest shift you've seen? Drugs by far, the okay. use of drugs. Okay. And you were instrumental in the drug court, you are part of the drug court. Well, so the best way I can explain why I even started a drug court program, and please keep in mind that I was not the first municipal court judge to start a drug court program. Uh, there's probably now about 80, maybe 100 drug courts throughout the state of Ohio. Okay. And, and, um, and these are called specialized dockets, per se. And so some of them are specialized around drugs. Some are specialized around domestic violence. Some around alcohol offenses. Okay. Uh, some are geared or designed towards veterans. Uh, but the one that I felt that our county needed was uh, to have a program that was focusing on the drug problem in our community. And so in, what I realized in the past is that as a judge, people would continue to use while placed on pro after being placed on probation. And so I would stick them back into jail to get them to dry out. Not that that's not necessarily a good thing to do, but there are other options for sure. And so I realized that uh, we needed to start looking at another way to handle the drug problem. And so on Valentine's Day 2007, I started what's called the Fresh Start Program, which is a, a drug court program. And so we've been in operation for about eight years, and we have had some amazing accomplishments that I'm very proud of. You, know, you had a great staff, and I know you think a lot of a lot of, of your staff. I had a super staff. Yeah, uh, yeah. One of the most difficult um, conflicts that I've had in taking the new position is that I knew I would be leaving an incredible staff behind. Right. That's not to say that my new staff isn't going to be equally incredible. Right. But certainly the old staff was amazing. Well, and I think that uh, you know when I look at some of the things where you had the uh, the picnic uh, and you had the Christmas party for people that are in the program. Uh, it, it just was kind of like going beyond just being a judge, but going one step saying, not only uh, am I here to, to uh, administer this program, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make sure even uh, beyond that that we're doing some things to help you. I'd like to mention this at this very time, and that is um, Sheriff Dave Phelan attended every single event that my drug court program ever had. And whether that was playing kickball in support of our Fresh Start people or, um, or if it was uh, being at the annual Christmas party. And, and uh, your support was truly amazing. And uh, you're a dear friend yeah. and will always be. Well, and I'll never forget this. And, I, and uh, in 2003, it was a couple days before Christmas. And uh, Judge Trimmer's a, a great woodworker. And he actually made a nativity scene, and I mean, he, he built the house, uh, he, and it was—it's about that high. It's a nice nativity, uh, the manger scene, and uh, delivered it to Loretta and I at our house. And to this day, uh, every Christmas, see, we always think about you know, on Christmas because uh -huh. we had that out on on our main uh, in our kitchen, going between the kitchen and the dining room, and we get more comments uh -huh. almost every year about that nativity scene because it's a, it's it's terrific. 
and uh, and I guess for a period of time you were making like one a year. And one then a year, give, giving give it certain... away. But ever since I had my child, it, it, I've kind of uh, yeah. haven't been doing that so much. But that couldn't have gone to a better family. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Well, we uh, we think about you every Christmas. It was very thoughtful, and it's one of those things that uh, it will have a generational impact yes. because we'll be putting that. You know, to our uh, kids and their grand, our grandkids, and so that'll just be passed down for, for many generations. Uh, I'm glad you appreciate it. Yeah. Now, uh, we don't have a lot of time, so I'd like to have you back uh, next week and, and talk a little bit about the common pleas thing. But uh, uh, what would be the, the average uh, person that comes through the, the drug court? I mean, would it be, what would be a, an age range? Sure. Uh, what would be uh, a, a sex? And, sure. And, and what, what do we see there? Absolutely. I would say the average age in my drug court program was about 24 to 25 years of age. Okay. Typically the pattern that I've noticed over the years, because I've asked a lot of questions in this process to kind of learn what's been happening in our society, and so typically at the age of 12 to 13 uh, is the introduction of marijuana in a person's life. And then from marijuana, typically it goes to pills. Uh, so we're talking mostly about the opiates. And then um, from the opiate pills comes the heroin. The heroin typically is being introduced into a person's life around 17 or 18 years of age. So I would say about the average number of years a person has been hooked on heroin in my program was about five to seven years. Uh, not that everyone in our drug court program were heroin users, but I would say about 80 to 85 percent of uh, the 30 or so participants were hooked on heroin. Uh, we also had individuals hooked on methamphetamines, that's crystal meth, uh, cocaine. We had a couple of inhalers. So um, if you can imagine somebody that gets kind of excited about a, a can of, um, of stain from yes. a hardware store. Yeah, wow, yeah. how tragic. Very tragic. One of the trends that we've seen in, uh, within the jail system is, th this is almost hard to believe, but. Uh, when I became sheriff, now I'm starting into my 15th year, our female jail population would be somewhere between 8 and 10 females. Well, um, you know, today we see it's, it's not unusual to have 60, 70, 80 females. So we have really seen that, that, that group jump tremendously, and uh, almost all of them are addicted to the heroin or opiates. It's true. So it's, so it's very, very problematic. You know, I think, I think decades ago, maybe two decades ago or so, um, typically it was the men that, right. were, that were using drugs, living this reckless lifestyle, and the women would typically be more responsible, stay at home, care for the kids. Right. And unfortunately, that's not there for the children anymore. It's affecting both sexes, as you had mentioned, equally. If you have Tom, I'd like to have you back next week. Sure. And uh, we're going to talk about maybe some of the goals you have for the Common Pleas. Yes. And uh, what an exciting time. So appreciate the Honorable Judge Dave Trimmer, Common Pleas uh, Judge here in Fairfield County, uh, taking a time out of your busy schedule. I know this is a busy, busy day for you, and it's very nice of you to come in and, and take time to do this program. Well, the clock on the wall says we're just about out of time, and do appreciate you, the viewers and listeners. Appreciate our executive producer, Kelly Roberts, lining the guest stuff, working on the questions, a lot of behind-the-scenes stuff, and certainly the students here at Fairfield Christian Academy that produce and uh, tape this program every week and we just have a lot of uh, folks behind the scenes that make this program possible and I'm very thankful for that. Until next week, same time, same place, God bless and we'll see you right here next week. waters were woven into the culture of Native American tribes. The descendants of the early Europeans built a business here based on agriculture. And today, 
this unique destination in the central Ohio countryside comes to life with stories and memories centuries old. The Fairfield County Historical Parks invites you to amazing Rock Mill. Above the falls of the Hocking River Gorge, here, together, nature and man have created some truly American stories that you'll want to experience with the entire family. Visit us or learn more about Rock Mill and the largest wooden water wheel in the nation at historicalparks.org.